Um, I thought that I would kick it off um, with a question that Ali and I were talking about, which is this is an event sponsored largely by the Wyoming Humanities Council. We have a literature scholar, we have an economics scholar, we have a biodiversity scholar on our panel. And I wondered if you, would if you wouldn't mind talking for a moment about how each of you understands your work. This might be easier for you, Caroline, I don't know. But how each of you understands your work in relationship to the humanities and why it's important to think about your work in relation to the humanities. I'll resist the uh, oh, real temptation to say, well, you know, economics is an art, and sometimes it's an arts and sciences, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, how do I understand my work in connection with the humanities? I think that one of the things I've learned, because I was quite conventionally trained in Edinburgh as an undergraduate, um, but, but trained to think about literature culturally, uh, just as you talk about the culture of species, even even antelope, you know, for, uh, establishing behavior patterns and so on. That literature, which which we read because it's so pleasurable and um, so thoughtful, but it's also thought provoking, and it also carries the history of how we think. It gives us a sense of how we might change how we think. It helps us to critique the ways in which we think, be uh, be and act. Um, and that piece of literary, literary study got a real impetus uh, <coughs> in the last 20, 30 years, and it's now a, a distinct way of thinking. So even, even those things are becoming much more interdisciplinary. So if you're someone like me these days working in literary study, on the one hand, you're still appreciating, enjoying, et cetera, the, the, the art that's in front of you. On the other hand, you're thinking of it very much as connected culturally, and connected culturally gets, gets you, for instance, to medicine, then gets me through to science. Um, which is why you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about how doctors behave and how that's a kind of culture and how the science it can be fabulous and the culture can be all wrong or the culture can be very helpful. And so those boundaries of humanities um, are actually quite permeable and interdisciplinary, I think. Sure. Um, so my wife argues that I have intellectual attention deficit disorder. <laughs> and what, I, what that means is I don't see disciplinary boundaries as very clear ones. Um, Aldo Leopold was a fantastic biologist, and he was also a phenomenal writer with a very keen sense for his culture. And the mission of my institute, and I hope I didn't invite you to the very simple, whenever you go to learn, you go there. But this place is not going to be full of science, it's going to be full of art. And it's going to be full of people that do readings in poetry and so on. And the reason for that is that I'm convinced that with science, with data, you can change people's minds. But it's not enough. You have to change people's hearts. And that's what the arts and the humanities um, do. So thank you. I think so economists have a reputation of being very arrogant. And <laughs> Um, they also have, they're known for having physics envy and trying to understand the world, trying to pretend that they're real scientists and do a lot of math. And, and we're coming around now, this is kind of since, since I was in grad school, so, so we're talking the last 15 years. We're coming around to realizing, no, 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 we really need to understand people and we need to understand psychology, behavioral economics is becoming a very big part where we understand People don't necessarily do rational things all the time and calculate. And, and actually today, one of the things I learned um, as I was interacting with you and, and, and responding to questions is, and kind of as stuff was coming out of my own mouth, I was realizing I, I need to understand also more how stories matter and, and how misunderstandings about what I was talking about, right? How people misunderstand how the economy as a whole works is because they're telling themselves morality plays and stories and, and try to make sense of the world in terms of stories that they know, like how they need to belt tighten when they get in trouble at, on the household level. And those, so I, I'm actually, this, this event is making me more aware of, I need to bring more humanities into, the, into economics, not just psychology, but also just the storytelling. So we'll just open the floor to questions from <coughs> any and all of you. How do you remain optimistic uh, concerning biodiversity when we live in a world with uh, a greater spread of uh, invasive species, 
uh, land being subdivided more and more and population increases that all put pressure just in the other direction to where some people advocate that we're looking at the fifth great extinction event. The great extinctions, we know from paleontology that they've been fifth, five big extinctions caused by a variety of things. And we can characterize it by the loss of 75 of all species, a very rapid loss. We're not there yet. The rate is right, but we haven't reached the 75% level. I, I, I dread to the moment where that will happen. Um, I will define myself not as a, an optimist. George Orwell defined himself as a happy pessimist. <laughs> and I think that's what we have to do. And, and he has a great piece. Um, I think he was a, a great prophet of the Green Movement, George Orwell was. And he has this piece on dandelions. <laughs> and I think that we have to, we have this big loss. And we have to grieve it. And we have to do as much as we can. We have to take joy in the little things that, that happen around you every day to remain sane. And if not optimistic, at least happy and pessimistic. And so, you know, I did like the word Laramie. And my joy is seeing my children catch crayfish. <laughs> and um, they're invasives. <laughs> That's all right. I shoot pheasants. Too many for my academic good. Um, and those kinds of things. I think that, I'm sorry, I'm not a psychologist. Who, 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 I'm going to tell anybody how to be happy, for God's sakes. Um, but I think that we have to, um, I, I, I use as a mantra now for the Institute that we care about wild creatures because we're in Wyoming. But we have to pay attention also to wild, domestic, and feral and understand them as well. And I think they bring you not only knowledge and so on, but a lot of joy. I don't know if that answers your question. It's, it's a psychological one. And uh, we have to remain optimistic. And, and in Wyoming, we can. I, I really, I'm sorry, I may be deluding myself. Mm -hmm. But I really think that we can get it. There's a lot of work to do. And sometimes you kind of despair. But I think we can. And uh, I, I sincerely hope that this darn institute that the university created, the fact that it's created, we are the only biodiversity institute in the West. That's pretty damn good, isn't it? Um, so I think we can, I think we'll do great things. And I'm sorry, uh, maybe it's just folly to be optimistic. <laughs> I'm going to pick up on that question, actually, because I think as I worked on, on this, um, I was often in mind of, of Monty Python and the Holy Grail and the line, not dead yet. <laughs> right? um, and um, as we were coming up in the plane, we were talking about some really powerful stories about um, science ecosystems and, and overlapping with culture and people like, um, for instance, Carl Hyacinth, who writes hysterically funny books, but they're about these kinds of issues and about um, learning how to balance social needs and economic needs and biodiversity and so on, and the great power of those kinds of stories. And so I, I kind of think that, that, yes, the world is made up of laws and economics and science, but we can really educate ourselves through stories, and we can change what we do through stories. And some of those stories are enormously powerful at generalizing the kinds of science that, that people do that's very necessary and, and making it clear to us how we might all need to you know, or could do things differently. It's for the, <coughs> the economist over there. In your play, I asked you this question earlier, you didn't talk about the fellow's cousin, Fred, called China. <laughs> How does Fred affect our life? I actually had prepared a little story about Fred because I expected comments. Fred the foreigner, right? Uh, who lives next door and makes um, toys, Barbie dolls, cars that Sally and Bob like. And so they, Fred works for them, and Sally and Bob, is all, that's all they have. They give Fred Monopoly dollars. What's Fred, Fred going to do with the Monopoly dollars? They only work in the household, right? So this is, this is U.S. dollars that go abroad when we import. What are they going to do with it? Well, to a large extent, they come back to us as, as exports. To some extent, 
they get used to, instead of buying our exports, they buy government debt. And the whole China thing, I don't know, there's, there's a story there <laughs> where that's, that gets blown up and, oh, what if the Chinese decide to become unfriendly and do something and isn't this all very dangerous? It's, it's very overblown. It, the, the Chinese own maybe 9.5% of our debt and another 9% is Japanese. The, the Chinese fraction is going down quite rapidly now. The Japanese one is picking up. So I, I think people are worried about somehow being controlled by the Chinese, and that's just not what's going on. Um, if anything, it would, at this point in time, given that we're in a recession, it would be very good if they stopped buying, um, if they did stop buying our, our um, government debt. And the flip side of that is if we then had to start producing more of our goods ourselves, because we have a lot of factories now that are, are not producing enough and a lot of people out of work. And so it would actually be a godsend if, if less of that happened. And in fact, it is already happening. Because of the recession, there's a lot less being imported, in a, and there is a movement to start bringing manufacturing back to the US. But it's, it's, people still tell scary stories that are just completely overblown. Well, who else owns? part of our debt. And those two you mentioned. Oh, do we have a bigger? It's, it's about, the rough, the figures are 50% domestic. So that's just Americans owning government debt. Sorry. That's Sally. Um, then a big chunk, the, then a big chunk is um, <coughs> the Federal Reserve, which is still Americans. Just, it's not the public, but it's part of the government that owns our own debt. And I think it's about 30% overall no, it not maybe fifty percent. That is foreign owned, of which about a fifth is Chinese, about a fifth is Japanese, and the rest is Europeans. Yeah, all kinds of countries, Brazil, all over the place. You mentioned that Greece has a problem curing its its economic in Spain and Ireland, Portugal, because they don't have, they're not able to have their own money. Do you think that the euro is a bad thing? I'm originally Dutch, and so I know the history of the euro, and I, I, so I have a, a, a slightly different... Economically, it's not a good idea, because Europe is just too varied, too not unified enough. It's very much like the U.S. might do better if every state had their own currency, right? Because they could do the same thing. If, if a state gets into a, a, an economic funk like Nevada, right, they could devalue their currency and export more. and bring their economy back up. They can't do that now because they are stuck with the, the US dollar. But the US is a really united country, and so it works. Europe is not. <laughs> but then I, now I do dare to, because it's far enough from home, to uh, bring some politics in. I do think, for purely political reasons, I'm quite happy with there being a euro, because it's the only hope that I feel to unify Europe in the long run and get past all the wars that we've had over the centuries. So for purely political or cultural yeah. reasons, I think the euro is a good thing. Economically, it's not a very good thing right now. Klaus, in, in your talk, the political and economic realms seem repeatedly to be at loggerheads. That You said this isn't a morality play. To the extent that it is, it seems politics is the culprit, that politically we want to read morality play onto our economic uh, scenario. So I wonder, what do you see recipes to to have ec economists and politicians and political thinkers um, working productively together, or is it just too is our economics just too seductive as a morality tale for politicians ever to give that up? I, I after the kind of response I, I I got last time when I gave this lecture and, and today again, I, I really somebody actually in Jackson last year said. You should be taking this story, you know, on the road to high schools. And I think the only hope is to get more kids in high school and in college understanding the fundamentals, the kind of stuff that I try to teach you guys. And then, because politicians are just responding to what the public wants to hear, right? If the public wants to understand it in terms of households and firms, and what are you going to do if you try to get elected? You're going to respond to what the what the public wants to hear. And so the only I, the only way I see out is the public getting more educated about the reality, and then politicians are going to respond to 
no, that's not the right way to think about it, and we need to frame it in a different way. But right now, all the incentives are wrong. I'm always interested, as somebody who studies Scottish culture, that Adam Smith gets quoted so frequently, in America in particular, right about the invisible hand and this affair and so everything else. And I, and I want to say, yes, but in terms of stories, have you read his other book? Because his other book is a treatise of moral sentiments, and it's about um, sympathy. Uh, and have I got the right? Uh, empathy. empathy. No, I'm trying to remember the oh. name of the book. Oh. But anyway, it's a <laughs> theory of moral sentiments. Theory of moral sentiments. And it's, it is about empathy. It's about projecting yourself into the other person's shoes, trying to understand that, and then renegotiating your society. It's a, kind of, it's, it's a sort of economy of sympathy. And, and empathy is said, and you can probably talk about it better, but it's a really interesting sort of competing story or a related story by Adam Smith. I guess he didn't think that they were competing necessarily. No, no. He thought of them together, and we seem to have remembered only one. I was thinking about um, so the cutthroat and the uh, Cutthroat and the lake trout, maybe uh, sagebrush and cheatgrass, maybe whitetail and mule deer, maybe uh, economics and environment. And I'm wondering if there are some optimistic ways that the, um, the economy and the environment um, can uh, uh, both, like the $2 billion that Wyoming gets from uh, harvesting and whatever, the tourism and all that. Um, other environmental or uh, economic ways, anyway, that is a more of a optimistic uh, world. Can we do a mano a mano? I get started and I pass it to class. Sure. <laughs> so I think one of the fields of ecology that is, it is really growing rapidly is ecological economics. And I, I'm proud to say that the University of Wyoming is one of the top places in the world to do that kind of stuff. And one of the things that people do is ecosystems um, services value. Uh, we need to start valuing the services provided by biodiversity. And, uh, and that is one of the things that my colleagues in the economics department do. So I pass it to class. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is very much um, what the majority of my colleagues in, in uh, at the department in Wyoming do, we decided long ago we can either be a small department, we can either be mediocre in a whole bunch of little fields, or we can just concentrate on one field and be good in that. And so we picked environmental economics, and, and we are a, a top department in that area. And that is all about, so I'd like to, to ask my students, um, I just throw out the question, tell me something that you, that you care about, and they talk about it. They, they mention all kinds of things. Every single thing that you care about, as long as it's not scarce, has value to us economists. And in principle, we can try to put a dollar value on it. And that includes sunsets. It includes being able to look at the beautiful pictures that Carla showed and be emotionally moved. That's part of economics. But the, a lot of people misunderstand economics and think it's all about the bottom line, it's about profits. and No, all that stuff, clean air, right? being able to fish, all that has has value, and what econ economics tries to do is maximize value, no matter what source it comes from. It could also be from playing a video game or racing your car down the road or, or what, whatever it is, but try to maximize value and husband our resources as carefully as possible. That's what economics is about, and e environmental economics is bringing that into the picture. And But that involves being finding creative ways of, of quantifying, putting dollar figures on, sunsets and clean air and trout and that, that's what a lot of my colleagues are, are involved in and what I do myself as well. And I think that to the extent that I'm optimistic, I think that that is one of the avenues that, that might help um, preserve biodiversity when people start really seeing hard numbers backed up by research for how valuable things like biodiversity really are and start then realizing, no, there's a trade-off, right? That yes, we, we really need the energy development, we need the jobs, but there's real costs to them that don't necessarily get measured in the market right now, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't count them and shouldn't um, do a cost-benefit analysis that includes those costs as well. Any other questions? You know, one of the fascinating things about today is, uh, especially on the economics and with biodiversity, <clears throat> we're exposed to ideas that are counterintuitive. The paradox of thrift, the 
extent to which the lake trout can have an impact on elk herds. Um, and yet, what we are told and what we and what I come away believing is that there is a strong consensus in the economic community and the scientific community that these things are true. And and how do you uh, express that power of that consensus, that objective truth, in a more popular culture? You know, I mean, I think that's one of the challenges. Perhaps that's where the humanities comes in. That that's the vehicle under by which you tell stories about what happens when we ignore the truth. I don't know. It just means I don't. But I. But do you, appre I, I'm sure you must, but do you fully appreciate just how counterintuitive the <laughs> paradox of thrift is? And those lake trout, I mean, you know, I just didn't... Uh... Yeah, isn't that fabulous? <laughs> but anyway, I think that we have made a mistake. And we have made the mistake of the, on, the, on the one hand and on the other hand. I think that we, 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 we tend to be too tentative. And in ecology, we are awful, absolutely awful at it. We qualify everything. Damn it. There's a bunch of things that we know, and we know them really well. And we can manage things very, very clearly. And so I think we have to be a lot more, um, we have to say very clearly what we know, what we don't, and what we need to know. And I, I think that the sciences and economics are very, very good at, um, at doing that. And one of the fears I have often with, uh, with the humanities, and then you will get mad, is that, is that the humanities tend to be much more Everything is a narrative, everything depends on a perspective. But I tend to be a realist, you know? I mean, scientific knowledge, you say that you scratch a, a, a postmodern in a plane and out bleeds a scientist, you know, because if the, train, if the plane falls, you really fall. It's not an imaginary plane. <laughs> and so I, I tend to think that we have scientists, and I don't know if the economists, is, 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 it, is it the same? We've been too tentative. There's a bunch of things we know very well. <clears throat> climate change, and I may get in cold water with this. There is as good evidence for climate change, and that we're causing it, uh, as for any other observation science. It's very, very good. And we're still debating, oh, maybe <coughs> now there's a 10% chance of this and that. We have to be a lot more assertive, and I think um, better at communicating those things. The problem is that scientists suck at communicating science, because we spend our time fighting with each other about minutia. But the big picture is pretty clear. So we think that we have to communicate with the public the way we communicate uh, with other scientists. The story I told you about the, um, uh, the lake trout is, of course, a lot more complicated. <laughs> but if, if I had given you all the uncertainties, the effect of climate change on green up and so on, uh, I wouldn't have given you the punchline of the story. So we have to become much better storytellers. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you, you <laughs> said something about the humanities. I got to respond. Um, I think this is, this is the thing. You can tell any story you want. And that is, that is a real question, right? Um, and so <coughs> and stories are immensely powerful. I think we really undervalue how powerful stories can be, although you can see how powerful they are whenever you can't actually get down. Can't, can't, it's very hard to communicate the, the exactness of the science that you have because there are so many stories circulating. And so then that's the question where humanities and storytelling really intersect with ethics. And to, to, the, the, yes, we can tell any story. We can tell it any way we want. But that's why it's really important to have that sort of humanistic education in trying to analyze, understand, critique, and the ethical underpinning from a field like philosophy that actually helps determine you know, what, what is, yes, there are lots of stories. What is the story to which you want to subscribe? And that's a major issue. University of Wyoming uh, last year, uh, the president of the college uh, uh, had a piece of artwork taken out because of industry and political pressure. Do you at all feel threatened or are you aware of any uh, uh, roadblocks that you might have in your own research or studies from industry controlling university policy? Carolyn? When you work in the sciences or, or a field that is visibly expensive, right, people pay a lot of attention to what you do. Um, and, and it's a lot uh, less common for us to get that, that kind of attention. Um, and, uh, but when we get it, we really get it. 
Uh, I think what was fascinating to me about the, the carbon sink was um, how it was situated on campus. Uh, so I will speak as a critic, not, a, not an artist, and um, uh, we tend to say, not entirely correctly, but it is, a, but it is a, a compelling way of thinking of things, that an artist creates something, and then the artist is not there when you're looking at it. Right? The artist has actually very little control over the reception in the future. Um, and so I really wish that uh, the opportunity had arisen for that piece of art to be viewed as a piece of art, and then to think about the, the cultural pieces around it, and instead it sort of became this, it's hard to you know, resist the metaphor, a mini firestorm um, of carbon sink, uh, that, that sort of made it difficult for us to actually do the kind of work we would normally do in trying to understand that and trying to think about it in the context of a Wyoming culture, which is itself a varied culture, and as a piece of art, which is a fascinating piece of art. Um, and I have to say, it was right out my window across uh, in the sunken garden, but it's so, as a piece of art, it was so sunken, I never got to it. It was gone before I got to see it, which is, I think, remarkable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to think that I'm pretty saddened by, that thing, by, by the whole thing, because we lost an opportunity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mainly because we lost an opportunity. And the opportunity is that a university is a place, if anything, where people talk with each other. And, and we lost the opportunity of having a civil discourse. Uh, people say that we have communities of consensus. We don't. I mean, that's silly. We have a community of dissensus in universities. We fight like crazy. We disagree. You know, you put uh, five academics in one place, you have five different opinions. And, and the student missed the opportunity of having a rich discussion about this, about climate change. Is it true or not? What's the evidence? About what's the role of art? But what's the role of the legislature in, um, in funding a place and, and how much say they have to have, etc. We, lo we lost an opportunity. Uh, and that is the saddest thing that could, could have ever happened. There's another thing that I think is sad, is that I hope there's no uh, temptation among us to self-censor as a result of that thing. I think that we have to remain uh, an open space for discussion and use this um, it was clearly a focus, right? I didn't go like this. Use them to focus our discussions and have diverse discussions. We really missed the boat on that one. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, um, but that's for political types. <laughs> Interestingly, though, when you say, I hope there won't be a pressure to self-censor, you don't express that hope unless you think, unless you fear that there will be a pressure to self-censor. Self I, I, there was another related incident a couple of years ago at the University of Wyoming when Bill Ayers was invited to speak at, at campus and the invitation was withdrawn because of a political firestorm and a financial or donor potentially firestorm and then the invitation was re-extended. I ended up going to his talk um, where there are, I don't know, 200, 500 people in attendance and I, he hit the nail on the head when he said it had absent the political controversy I would be sitting in a circle with 10 people but the political com controversy made it the thing to do on campus was to go to hear him. I was very proud um, in the aftermath of that event that the university sponsored a symposium on academic freedom in which they brought experts on academic freedom from law, from philosophy, from narrative studies, from around the country to come and talk about what is the place of a university in um, providing a forum for dissenting opinions to be discussed, to be discussed in relationship not just to opinion but to the facts, to the history, um, to the truth, dare I say it, of different um, kinds of academic positions. And ultimately, I think what that symposium was getting at was what Carlos has talked about. We owe it to our students not to shelter them from dissenting opinions, from ideas that might threaten them in their cultural, social, political, economic comfort zone. We owe it to them to give them the tools to get down and dirty and be strong, analytical thinkers and um, persuasive communicators. I would say that um, uh, nothing is ever lost, and so uh, the kind of, of um, students who bring that critical perspective to bear, uh, trying to understand things, for them, the whole, the emails, the newspaper articles, and everything now that's surrounded the carbon sink or whatever is their subject for study, um, to try to make better decisions in the future and try to have better discussions. I was wondering, uh, you were talking about getting 
groups to talk together, like BLM and all. Are you uh, including groups that are land conservatives, like the Wilderness Society and the Land Trust and people like that? Most certainly. I that, think that would be. A, it's a it's a very important thing to to have. I'm sorry to use like techno speak, but all the stakeholders have to be part of it. One of the things that we are doing a lot of this starting this summer is that poor managers in the state, uh, are, it's like doing this, they have to read all the scientific literature, they have to manage the population, they have to do all these things. And we're, one of the things we're doing is workshops of capacitation and hopefully in an informal way we will bring people together besides the formal discussions. And next year is is it the 100th anniversary? Help me on that. 50. The 50th anniversary of the, the 2014, right. of the Wilderness Act. And that will bring people together from a variety of places. I'm not, because we don't do pol policy quite so much. We will not participate quite so much. But the Hub School will have fora. And so, forums. I know what the plural is. Forums. Um, um, <clears throat> for, for that kind of thing. I hope, I really hope that the very center will be a place for the whole state to come together. I really. I'm going to boast about my humanities um, knowledge, but uh, there's a phrase in Shakespeare which is that a touch of nature makes the whole world kin. And I think it's true, and I hope that the Institute will be. As I was listening to all three talks, one of the themes that came out to me was sort of the law of unintended consequences of our actions. I mean, every one of your things, at least if I kind of paraphrase a little bit, seems to sort of turn on that, you know, lake trout. I mean, I'm sure the person who threw a lake trout and Lake didn't think that elk populations were going to crash, or that you know the admirable study of anatomy would lead to an increase in murder rate in Edinburgh, or even that saving money, an admirable personal thing, would tank the U.S. economy. You know, so, so I was wondering, how do you sort of communicate that to not only the public, but even your students and those critical thinkers were raising? I stories. I tell like stories, right? And, and to me, economics is all about. Exactly that link. That's that's all what economics. Is. That's what the invisible hand is about, right? When people are selfish, <coughs> looking after themselves, trying to maximize profits, trying to find the cheapest thing they can get, that actually helps the economy. They're actually helping other people, and that helps the economy. So that, that's an, that's a positive unintended consequence, and that's what the invisible hand is about. But then there's also the invisible foot, um, <laughs> where sometimes when people try to do the the best for themselves, they actually hurt people around them. And that's what the savings paradox, the thrift, the paradox of thrift is about. And so there's, there's a, a great economist, Thomas Schelling, who has a book called <coughs> Micro Motives and Macro Behavior. And that kind of takes all of economics and says that's what it's all about. It's what people do in their individual lives at the micro scale, just trying to, trying to do the best for themselves, sometimes has very different consequences when you, uh, on the macro scale. And, and, and that's true, true in, in biology ecology very much the same thing. Yeah. I, I tell my students when they are doing research projects, expect to be surprised. <laughs> I mean, no matter how good our models are and how good our science, science is. Uh, what is the, there's no, you know the, the problem, the, the first law of animal behavior um, that was, I, I, I don't remember who said it, but the, the first law of animal behavior is that under the most controlled circumstances, the animal will do as well as he damn pleases. <laughs> <laughs> and so you have to keep observing. <laughs> and what, oh, sorry, good. Um, and un unintended consequences, I think the, the whole Burke and Hare thing is unintended consequences <coughs> produce other consequences. And we can take some charge of those consequences. And so what's really interesting is how in all probability, there was, that this, this is not an Edinburgh discovery, right? That there were other places where um, <laughs> the market was producing a similar response locally. And in fact, um, in the d discussions about the Anatomy Act, the professor, the London professor of medicine said, um, you know, this is probably happening in lots of other places. Uh, Sir Astley Cooper, who was the prominent surgeon of the, of the time, said, if the doctors wanted me right now, they could have me, you know, they could, they could, they could make away with me. And the, so the result was of this particularly egregious case, right, 16 bodies, um, was that it did speed along the Anatomy Act. They'd been talking about managing this much better for quite a while. And so it really did, in the end, have consequences in law. But then the question is, once you've got the law or the set of protocols or the medical ethics, they're almost like having the rule book in your pocket. So you know that it's there. You know what you should do. But why should you do the right thing? 
And that's where I think the retelling of those stories became really crucial because it was the working through of trying to figure out um, the, what, what kinds of uh, assumptions, whether they are medical or in this case they were economic assumptions, produce that kind of behavior. What are the tripping points and, and what uh, should we not tolerate and what are our tripping points in terms of trying to recognize unintended consequences and respond appropriately. So now we have this history through storytelling to go back and learn about these things, which maybe um, the murders and everything gave us some good data to work with, which we're thankful for now. But now we have all this good data, both in the economic forefront that we were told about today, and scientifically, that we choose not to listen to, because it's not historical data yet, it's right here in our face. Why aren't we as a society getting smarter about that, or um, using some of this to our betterment instead of ignoring it, and still destroying our environment, and still in a recession? You know, can I be the optimist? I mean, how can I be an optimist? I think we've made, we've made progress. I think if we don't go extinct, we'll end up pretty well. And, and, um, I mean, we don't have public hangings anymore, do we? And slavery is pretty much gone. And I think we, you know, it, it's, who used to say, I think Doris Lessing used to say that our job was to push a boulder up a, up a, up a thing. And then it rolled back. But an inch will have moved. And then, well, we have to keep on pushing, right? And then another inch. I think, I, I hope not to be just completely Pollyanna, but um, we have to keep on pushing the damn boulder up. I'm sorry, I used the word damn like 50 times. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think, too, it's, um, it's, it's where we started. It's that in, investment, right? And in, what are you investing in? An investment in complex thinking. You know, hum humans are new constantly, right? So we're constantly capable of making the same mistakes or new and better or more better worse mistakes. mistakes, right? Because things themselves are so complicated. And so it's that constant disposition to be willing to think, to be willing to learn from history, to be willing to both, both tolerate complex thought and, and pursue choices that are not intuitive that are difficult, but nonetheless grounded in careful thought. And I think that's, that's sort of what the humanities are all about. Yeah. And there's, there's also a commitment. You have, one has to, you have to figure out your commitment to action in the knowledge that as a human being you are going to make mistakes, that you're not going to get it right. So one of the plays that I teach is one of the foundational plays in the Western tradition, Oedipus Rex. This is the leader of Thebes who's trying to find out why the plague is ravaging Thebes so he can cure his city and he's going to pursue the truth um, in the name of his role as, as a leader. And what does he discover in his pursuit of truth? That he's killed his father and slept with his mother and had four kids with his mother. It's a disastrous discovery that he makes, but is, is the risk of making a, dis, a troubling personal discovery or troubling societal discovery um, so great that you shouldn't pursue the truth? that you shouldn't pursue the, good, the common good where it takes you, knowing, though, in that pursuit, that you're risking, that you're almost inevitably going to find something that's really troubling and that threatens your own sense of how much you control your destiny. One of the things that I always tell my students at the beginning of the, the semester is um, when it comes to the big picture questions, I want you to, at the end of the semester, leave my lecture hall more confused than when you came in. <laughs> and I'm dead serious about it, because I think a lot of the problems that we have is people thinking they understand. And, oh yeah, all I need to know is this one thing that will tell me all my answers, right, politically or economically or whatever. The, and and I, I want to shake them out of that, and I think that's our job as a university, where they, at the end of the semester, go like, no, everything is complicated. And I don't necessarily have the answer, and I need to stay open to different points of view and, and investigate it more. It's, it makes sense that there's no more hands up right now because it's 1:32. We've come to the perfect conclusion for our morning. Can I thank the speakers, the Humanities Council, Sheridan College, Ali, Dave, all of you for being part of this. We hope to see you again in July for another really stimulating interdisciplinary session. Thank you for making those of us from UW feel so welcome. It's been a great day.